Hello everybody. This is what the Bible says. You're watching live stream services. I am Armi Gisalva. I am the pastor emeritus of Bible Baptist Church. In a few minutes, you are going to listen to the word of God from our senior pastor, Pastor Kent Gisalva. A pleasant evening to each and every one. Once again, welcome to our Wednesday night service here at Bible Baptist Church and our churches here in the island and all over the world. We're thankful to the Lord that we can meet together online. As we say, this is the church at home. For the moment, during this time of lockdown and quarantine, we thank, we're thankful to the Lord for a technology like this that we can be able to join uh, with one another and our hearts together in worshiping the true and the living God. We're thankful to the Lord for the blessed time that we can be once again continuing day by day under His protection, under His provision. And once again, I urge each and every one to pray for one another, pray for your family, pray for our church family, as well as our Filipino family, our government officials, those that are uh, tasked in this uh, pandemic that is going on around the world, and uh, those that are our authority in our barangays continue to submit to their authority and pray for them that God will continue to keep them as well. For our frontliners, our medical personnel, and uh, our police men and women, those that are in the military, in the civilian authority, commit them to the Lord each and every day. We're thankful also to our church leaders who have been continuing to partner with us in uh, just keeping the members encouraged by their prayers, by their encouraging words, through their texts and through their uh, uh, chat groups, uh, opening up uh, avenues by which we can still fellowship online. And we're thankful to the Lord for that. Continue to bless one another with these wonderful words of truth and uh, words that will uh, encourage each and every one to move forward. Tonight, we will be continuing our series of lessons on the last days, on prophecy. And tonight, we're going to start a series of lessons on the book of Revelation. One of the favorite prophetic books in the Bible is the book of Revelation. In fact, the whole book is a prophetic book itself. And so let's start by opening our Bibles to Revelation chapter number 1. We will read just the first three verses of this chapter, but we will go on and survey the whole book of Revelation for tonight's message. Just a summary uh, of uh, the things that we have already discussed in the past uh, sermons, and I'd like to invite you to scroll back uh, in our Facebook page and uh, try to look back and see where you can be able to uh, just connect on uh, the series of lessons that we have been uh, studying on prophecy. Tonight, Revelation chapter 1 and verses 1 to 3. The Word of God says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto Him to show unto His servants things which must shortly Come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel and to his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Once again, dear Heavenly Father, in Jesus' mighty name, we come to your throne of grace, thanking you for the time where once again we can be able to hear your word. Thank you for the privilege of preaching your word. Thank you, Lord, for your people who have been eager Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, or every time that your word is being brought forth in the airwaves, in the internet, and Lord, in our different chat groups, and modes and means of communication. We pray, Lord, that your word tonight will have free reign in each and every one's heart as we open our hearts to the Holy Spirit of God, who is the person that brings conviction to each and every one of us. May we be encouraged by your word. May we be inspired. May we be corrected if needs be. And Lord, I pray that tonight there will be a great revival in our hearts because we know that all these things that are happening in the world today are part of what you have already prophesied thousands of years back. We're thankful that your word is true, 
And no matter what people may say against your word, your word will remain true and sure. As you have declared, heaven and earth may pass away, but your words will never pass away. Be honored and be glorified in this message. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name alone. Amen. The central person of the book of Revelations is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're thankful that Jesus, not only in Revelation, is present from the first book in Genesis and on to the last book of the Bible, Revelations. Many people want to study prophecy, which Revelation or the book of Revelation, is, uh, um, its theme is centered on prophecy. And many people want to study prophecy. And it is a wonderful subject to study uh, on. And uh, the things that are to come is here in the book of Revelations. But sometimes we focus on the things that are to come, not the one that is coming. The word revelation comes from the word apocalypsis, meaning to unveil or to unmask, like one that is given a, a prize, and uh, that prize is veiled. And then when the person reveals the uh, veiled prize or the, re the veiled gift, it brings surprise and it brings joy to the one receiving it. And this is the same way when we understand, when we get to understand the book of Revelation. Although we have already studied prophecy from the different passages of Scripture in the Bible, from the book of Matthew, the book of uh, the Gospels as well, and also in the, Thessalon in the book of Thessalonians, and in many other portions of the New Testament and even in the Old Testament, uh, prophesying the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But in the book of Revelation, all these things in a more specific manner is going to be revealed. Our Lord Jesus Christ came first to redeem, but He is going to come back the second time to reign. He came first to be crucified on a cross, but He is going to be coronated on a throne. He was hung on a tree when He first came, but He is going to sit on a throne when He comes back again the second time. He came as a servant, but in this book of Revelation, we will read and we will know that He is coming as sovereign over all. King of kings and Lord of lords, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the center of prophecy and the center of the book of the Revelation. And we find that this is the central person of the book. We also find that the clear purpose of the book here in verse number 1 is to show to His servants things which must shortly come to pass. The word servant means bond slave, and one that has been set free by his master and willing to come back to be under the master's service. This slave wants to serve the master because he loves his master, not because he was bought, not because he was forced to serve, but now he is willing to serve his master. And that is a picture of a person that has been born again by the Spirit of God. Once we were slaves of Satan, but once we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our life, we now are set free from Satan. And now we are able to be given this opportunity to serve the one true master, the perfect master, the Lord Jesus Christ. The question is tonight, are you a slave of Jesus Christ. If you are not, then you will not be able to understand the book of Revelation, God's word on prophecy. This is a book written to the bond slave of Jesus Christ and to his servants, as the verse says. So the purpose of this book is to make us born again believers. If you're a born again believer in your home, you can say an amen to yourself there and to those that are with you. And if you are a born again believer, you are God's servants and you can be able by the aid of the Holy Spirit to understand and apply this book and its true message that it brings. So the clear purpose of the book is to show His revelation to His servants. The central person of the book is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see also the comforting promise of the book in verse number 3 is blessing. 
this is God's promise to each and every one that are going to read, they are going to hear, and they are going to keep. So this is the threefold mandate in order that you and I will be blessed. Blessed is he that readeth, blessed is he that heareth, and blessed is he that keepeth those things that are written in this book. So you and I are promised blessing. God is a God of blessing. And everywhere in the Bible, we find God's purpose and God's desire to bless His people by reading and heeding, getting it into our hearts. This book, we learn what is the mystery of history. Then we are going to be blessed by it. In this book, the world can never understand what is going on and is going to happen. But God is moving everything to a purpose, and that purpose is found here in Revelation chapter 11, verse number 15. The Bible says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and forever this war-torn sin-soaked devil-battered world is going to see jesus sitting on the throne to reign in power and majesty forever and forever now a little survey of the bible reveals that the first two chapters has no mention of the devil and so is also the last two chapters of the bible in the book of revelation has no mention of the devil. And this is such a great blessing to know what has happened in the past and to see what is going to happen in the future. The reason why things are such in a mess in our world today because things are out of place. They are not where they should be. Like, for example, the church is the bride of Christ and the church belongs to the groom. The church is not yet with Jesus. Jesus is the king, and the king belongs to the throne, and he is not yet ruling this world. The devil is the criminal, and he belongs in prison, yet he is not yet in prison. He is still roaming this world, but the Bible prophesies, as God has prophesied, that he is going to be imprisoned forever, and there is no more devil that you find in the last two chapters of the book of Revelation. And we don't need any other book, New Revelations, because the Bible ends there, and eternity is what is next with our Lord Jesus Christ and for those that have accepted Him as Lord and Savior of their life. But one of these days, everything is going to be right. If we know the mystery of history, we can make sense of our suffering, our disappointments, our hurts that belong to this world of sin. Pain, death, destruction, tears, tribulation, and curses are upon this world. So what do we say to people that have been hit by a typhoon or have been affected by an earthquake or some pandemic like us that are in this pandemic right now? What do we say to people that have just lost a loved one or maybe a Christian that is suffering from a disease or sickness we say that it is not yet God's final plan for you death is not the end for the Christian this is the blessing of studying the book of Revelation in James chapter 5 verse number 8 the Bible declares be ye also patient establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. To be stable in our minds, we should know that there is a blessed hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the purpose of the Word of God. God's Word gives us comfort. God's Word leads us to the truth so that we can live in reality, not in fantasy. Many people get into trouble in their life because they try to live in a fantasy and not in reality which God has never designed us to be in a fantasy world, but in a world that is real. And so it is important that we have our minds 
transform into reality. And the only way that our minds can really think real and truth is through God's Word. We also find here, by way of introduction of this message, the certain prophecy of this book. Still in verse number 3, the last part, the Bible says, The time is at hand. Now, this prophecy was written over 2,000 years ago. But remember this, it may not have been immediate. The prophecy may not have been that immediate, but it is imminent. We are in the last days. Are we? Of course. When Jesus went up to heaven, the last days began. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 11. Look at what the Bible says. Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. In James chapter 5, verse number 8, Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 7, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, and watch unto prayer. 1 John chapter 2, and verse number 18, Little children, it is the last time, as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Jesus' is coming is very near. It is imminent. Any time, even right now, this broadcast can stop. Or maybe it can continue and you can stop listening to this broadcast because you are going to be caught up in the air to be together with our Lord Jesus Christ. We are going to be caught up together in the air. From the time Jesus came, and He will come again, we have been living on the edge of eternity. This is what it means by the word imminent return of our Lord Jesus Christ. The time is at hand. John, the beloved, wrote through the aid of the Holy Spirit, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the book of Revelations 2,000 years ago, writing it inside a prison, in the island of Patmos. Now, how are we going to understand this book? In verse number 19 of chapter number 1, we find, write the things. This is what God told John. Write the things which thou hast seen, number one, and the things which are, number two, and the things which shall be hereafter. So, practically, the Holy Spirit tells John, write the things that were past, write the things that are present, and write the things that are going to be in the future. So, verse number 19 of chapter number 1 is key in understanding the divisions of the book of Revelation. And so, let's get into the study of the book of Revelation as we get into uh, or as we continue our study on prophecy. So, number one, the things that were, or the things which thou hast seen. What John saw. John saw the majesty of earth's sovereign. He saw a vision of Jesus Christ. He saw Jesus Christ as the glorified, conquering, and resurrected Christ. In Revelation, Jesus is not portrayed as Savior, but as judge. His countenance is like, the Bible says, the shining sun, his eyes like flaming fire, and his voice like a sound of many waters. In verse 12 to 18, this same John that lay at the bosom of Jesus Christ is this same John that saw the same Christ, and when he saw him in a different light, he fell as a dead man. In verse number 17, because he is now unveiled, as the glorified Christ. This is not the same Christ that was born in a stenchy manger. This is now Christ glorified and is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And secondly, we find the things which are. So the things which were the majesty of earth's sovereign, the things which are 
the mission of earth's saints. Jesus commanded John to write about the present time. Now, during that time, there was, it was already the start of the church age. And we are to, as the Bible commands the church, spread the gospel to every creature, to tell every person of the Lord Jesus Christ and the coming King, and Him as a coming King, and the wrath to come. The church age will end when Jesus will come back for His people in the rapture, as we have learned in the previous messages. Now, we are living in this time. To study the book of Revelation in the timeline of the church age, we go to chapters number 2 and chapter number 3. If you read the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, you will find the different names of cities locations of literal cities during that time primarily concentrated in modern day turkey right now and so let us go through very quickly these churches that have been literal churches mentioned in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of revelations and in, and also they these churches represent the seven periods of the church age to better understand this prophecy so we are now the things which are the things which were the things which are is now in chapters 2 and 3 first of all we find the church in Ephesus Ephesus means vigilance now Ephesus as the book of Revelation describes had lost its first love now Ephesus timeline starts from the first church which is a church in Jerusalem, and on to A.D. 100. So from A.D. 33 to A.D. 100, we call this the, the first church or the apostolic church, which the apostles started. That covers the church age under Ephesus. And secondly, we find the second church, the church of Smyrna. Now this is the era of persecution. Smyrna means persecution. Now, this church or this timeline covers A.D. 100 to A.D. 312, which the church was under the ten Caesars of Rome. And so, they had great persecution because the Caesars and the Romans didn't like what the Christians were doing and what they believed. And so, this was the time when they were fed to the lions they were burned um, uh, like candles, you know. They were, wax was poured on them and they were lit literally on fire and they were put on top of posts so that they could light the streets of Rome. Such great persecution. They were killed. They were sawn asunder and as the Bible describes. And this was an era of great persecution. The church in Smyrna. The church in Pergamum or Pergamos covers... A.D. 312 and A.D. up to A.D. 590. Now, this was the time that the church had united with the state. Or in other words, Christianity and paganism had united. Pergamum means the era of marriage. And it was admonished, the church was admonished to repent. But they did not. They were united. And hence, there are religions today that have terminologies of Christianity, but in actuality, their practice is paganism. That happened during A.D. 312 up to A.D. 590. Christianity was bursting at the seams, and they were growing in great numbers. And what did Constantine do? He joined and he united Christianity with paganism. And that is why there are many paganistic practices, but they are using biblical names, even using the Bible. And so that was that time, the church in Pergamum or Pergamos. And fourthly, the fourth church is the church in Thyatira. We find this also in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation. The church that had a false prophetess, and this was an era spanning the Middle Ages. 
from A.D. 590 to 1517. This was also the Dark Ages. And then we go to A.D. 1517 to A.D. 1750. This is the church in Sardis. Sardis is the church that had fallen asleep. This was the time of the Protestant Reformation. This was a time when there were a lot of heresies within the Christian church that had come out. And we go to church number six, which is the church in Philadelphia. And Philadelphia means the church of brotherly love. This was an era of revival and great awakening. From 1750 to 1925, this was the time when the church kept on sending out missionaries all over the world because of the great revivals that had happened in Europe and, then, and in America. We find that American churches and European churches had been sending out missionaries all over the world, and that is the time when the missionaries had come on up to Asia. And we're so thankful to the Lord for the blessing of that era. And now we come to the church of Laodicea. This is the last of the seven churches mentioned in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation. Laodicea means people's voice. This was the church of lukewarm faith. It was an era of higher criticism. When so many people are voicing out their feelings and voicing out their personalities and, and, and their thoughts, and a lot of criticism is what we see not only in our church but in our world today. The rise of democracy. Someone said this, that the voice of the people is the voice of God. That is not what the Bible teaches because it is not every time that the voice of the people is what God has told them to say or to voice out. The voice of God is the voice of God and the voice of the people is the voice of the people. And so we find here that in all these chapters of 2 and 3 and all these churches, there is one phrase that keeps coming back and forth. And we find it in verse number 11 of chapter 2. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is the administrator of His local church. And He has been speaking at every century, at every era, at every time to the churches. But many times the churches don't listen. We are in the Laodicean age, a lukewarm church age, a church where it is neither hot nor cold. But let me encourage you, if you're listening today, especially if you're a member of Bible Baptist Church or World in Need Baptist Church or all our daughter churches and mission churches here in the Philippines and all over the world, listen, let us not be a lukewarm church. Let us listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is speaking to us today. And the question is, are we hearing Him? Let us be sensitive to the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. He writes to the seven churches. In the Bible, seven is the number of perfection. There is no new church. There is only one church that Jesus established. And Jesus is the head of that church. And if you are a born-again believer, saved and baptized into that local church, you are part of the body of Christ. And so we find here the first division, the things that were, the majesty of earth's sovereign, the Lord Jesus Christ, the things which are, the present time, the church age, the mission of earth's saints. And then we find from chapters number for up to the last chapter, the things that shall be. So basically, in the book of Revelation, from chapters 1 to chapter 4, or the middle part of chapter 4, we are basically in this time frame of these chapters. 
when Jesus comes to take away and rapture His people, the saints, the saved, if you are born again, child of God, you're going to be raptured, praise God. Then, chapters 4, the end of chapter 4, on to the end of Revelation, is going to be in play. So let's break it down very quickly. The things that shall be. This is the fright of earth's summary. This is going to happen, folks. This is not something out of a comic book. This is not something out of a fantasy writer or some sort of sci-fi, uh, fictional imagination. It is going to happen. This is the prophecy coming out from the very heart of God. No buts, no maybes. This prophecy is for certain. It is not allegorical. It is not figurative. It is literal. That is why we are going to take most of our time, but a quick time in this message tonight as we close in this last point because this begins with chapter number 4 and ends up in chapter number 22. We want to see a bird's eye view of prophecy. Now, we have discussed this in our previous lessons and you can go back once again. As I remind you, you can go back and scroll back to our previous uh, lessons that have been posted in our Facebook page, Bible Baptist Church, Kadibunan, and World in Need Baptist Church in Mandawe. And here are the seven branches of prophecy, a bird's eye view of the things that shall be, the future that is going to happen after the rapture. So we start at chapter number 4, verse number 1. This is what we call the rapture, the translation the taking away of the saints of God. John is caught up into glory. And at any moment, the trumpet shall sound. And it is going to sound. And we are going to be leaving the sin-soaked world. It may sound supernatural. But, yes, it's going to happen. This is exciting for us as Christians. It's going to be frightening for the non-Christian. For those that do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 16, notice what the Bible says. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Jesus Christ is coming. Get it right or get left behind. If you are heaven born, you are going to be heaven bound. Born once, you die twice. Born again or born twice, you will die once. But for those that will be raptured, you will never taste death, as the Bible says. So first of all, we find the rapture and the translation of the saints in chapter number 4, book of Revelation, verse number 1. We jump to chapter number 6. And this is now the judgment, or as the Bible says, the great wrath of God. The tribulation of this world. In Revelation chapter 6 and in verse number 12, And I beheld... When he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Now here we find the world's cry for mercy. God is a God of mercy, the Bible declares. But He is also a God of wrath. 
His holiness demands righteousness. His holiness also demands mercy. His holiness also demands love. But His holiness also demands justice. The dam of God's mercy here will now open and His wrath is going to be poured out on this earth. Men shall be seeking death at this particular time so that all their pain and their sorrow and their fear and their fright is going to end, but death is going to run from men. Revelation chapter 9, verse number 6, the Bible declares, And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Thirdly, we find the rise of the beast of the Antichrist and the deceptions of the devil through the Antichrist. In Revelation chapter 13 and verses 1 to 3 are when the saints are taken out, then the Antichrist is going to appear and he is going to turn this world into a global concentration camp. You talk about lockdown, quarantine. No one likes this scenario. Many people already are sick and tired of just staying in their homes, just doing nothing, and even limited in doing something. They may be doing something, not literally doing nothing, but they feel, that the world today in general feels that they are not productive by just staying at home and, and with their limited space. Maybe some are blessed because they have a bigger space. Not only do they have a house, they have a, a, a big piece of land that they can roam around, but that is not the case for most people, especially for those that are in cramped city spaces. But the Antichrist is going to have this world in a global lockdown. All the inmates will be numbered by a mark. The Bible declares the beast's mark or the mark of the beast because that is what the Antichrist is. He is worse than a dictator. He is a monster. He is a beast. In Revelation chapter 13, notice what the Bible declares about the Antichrist and his global lockdown. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive the mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. One score in the Bible is twenty. Three score is sixty. So literally, six hundred sixty-six, or six, six, six is the mark of the beast. We already know that. Many people have already made movies and shows about 666 trying to downplay its reality. But let me tell you, this is real, folks. This is not just, just some Hollywood script or some uh, writer's script that they gave out there on television or, or a movie a script that they have uh, played out there. But let me tell you, this is real. Someone said, the more machines act like men, the more men will act like machines because we are approaching that day. Everyone will be in line, just like a factory line. Instead of men having their own wills as given by God, a free will to choose, this is going to be a time when this global dictator, the Antichrist, the beast, because if you will not believe and obey him, death will come to you. The day of Armageddon is the next in line for our survey. In chapter number 16 of the book of Revelation, starting in verse number 13, this is the day of the destruction of the Antichrist. Now, during this time, the devil inspired superhuman will be ruining this world for seven years. Evil spirits are going to infest the world like never before. This world that is demonic is nothing compared to the world that the Antichrist is going to rule in. It is going to be worse. 
these spirits are going to work in the kings, the rulers, the premiers, the presidents of the earth to draw them together under the global dictator, the Antichrist, and under his leadership and influence, they are going to battle God. They're going to call God in a battle. And this is going to take place in Megiddo. We find in the Bible that it is the day of Armageddon. Once again, many have used the term Armageddon. The term Armageddon means battle, the last battle, the end battle. In Revelation chapter 16, verse 13, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirit of devils, working miracles. And let me stop there. Not every miracle that you see comes from God. There are miracles that are happening in the world today that are not from God. You see, the devil is the great deceiver. He mimics and copies God. Do not underestimate Satan. He is powerful. He is not all-powerful, but he is powerful. But God is all-powerful. And therefore, it is important to get to know the one true God, for Satan has his false gods. And you may be praying to a false god, friend, come to the one true God. And the Bible is the one that will lead you to the one that you need to worship. The Bible declares, if you want to worship the one true God, you worship Jesus because you will never go wrong when you go through Jesus. Jesus declared, no man cometh unto the Father except through me. I am the way, Jesus said. I am the truth, Jesus said. I am the life, Jesus said. And no man cometh unto the Father except through me. Verse number 14, for they are spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gather them together into a place called the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. This is a literal place right now in the country of Israel. The beast practically having control over the world gathers his vast army in the valley of Megiddo surrounding the city of Jerusalem. If you find there the, the picture of Megiddo looking like the last time this highly contested nation, highly contested land will be removed from the Jews. But watch what happens in verse number 11 of chapter 19 as we move forward moving along in revelation 19 11, and i saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war his eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. This is Jesus Christ, folks. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. This is every saint, every born-again believer. That's you and me if you are born again. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw the beast and the king of the earth and their armies gathered together, verse number 19, to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him and with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worship his image these both were cast alive into a lake of fire 
burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Now Jesus at this time is not coming for his people, but with his people. From those that were raptured and those that were already in heaven will join together with our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, our King. And we are going to be with Him in this great battle. The same word that brought, the same word that these people that are fighting God had brought them into existence will disintegrate them into oblivion. Moving on in Revelation chapter 20, we find the millennium and the glorification of the Savior. Now imagine John writing and seeing all these things like a 4K quality high definition television just right before his eyes everything has been laid before him as a vision and in Revelation 20 verse number 1 the Bible says and I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand and he laid hold on the dragon that old serpent which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now these verses are talking about us Christians. We will rule with Jesus for a thousand years. This is going to be the millennial reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. The earth's time has been 6,000 years. And Jesus is going to reign 1,000 years. That will be 7,000 years for earth's total life. Not billions, but thousands. 7,000 years. The Bible declares that one day with the Lord is a thousand years. Earth's history has already been 6,000 years, tantamount to about six days. God created the earth in six days. On, on the seventh day, He rested. This last thousand years will be a day of rest for the earth. This will be a glorious day. The whole earth will be filled with the power, the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ. It will be filled with the knowledge of God as waters that cover the sea. What a day that will be. This will be a time when the desert will bloom as a rose and the trees with their leaves will clap for joy to the one who rules and reigns on the throne, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the day when the lion and the lamb sit side by side, and the lamb is not in the mouth of the lion. Oh, what a day. And second to the last, we find the final judgment and condemnation of sinners. Revelation chapter 20, verse number 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it after the millennium. This is what's going to happen. The final judgment and condemnation of sinners from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life 
was cast into the lake of fire. Friend, if you are not written in the Lamb's book of life, that means that you have not accepted Jesus Christ, only Jesus Christ, and His finished work on the cross as the Lord and Savior of your life. And you will have a date with deity. You are going to face God in that great white throne. The believers are going to have a judgment day. That is going to be the judgment seat of Christ, not to decide their destination, but to decide their rewards and their positions. A great white throne. All the dead in the land, all the dead in the sea, and all the souls that are in hell will be joined with their bodies in judgment standing. This will be the resurrection of the dead, the resurrection unto damnation, while the others were resurrected unto life. But this resurrection is a resurrection to damnation, and their bodies and their souls will be cast into the lake of fire. From hell to a greater, more terrifying and terrible judgment, the Bible calls the second death. If you will not meet Him today as Savior, as Jesus extends His hand to you, friend, you will meet Him as sovereign, as judge. I urge you tonight, accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't think of Jesus as a religion. Think of Him as a person. Because if you think of Him as a person, you are going to think about the word relationship, not religion, but relationship. And when you come to Jesus, come to Him as you are. You don't have to do anything because Jesus has already done it for you. You don't have to pay for your sin. The reason why people go to hell is because of sin. And Jesus paid for our sin, your sin, my sin, all the words sin, from the first man, Adam, to the last man that is ever going to be born. Jesus paid for all our sin. And all we need to do is to receive that payment because it is God's gift to you. A gift has already been paid for. You don't have to work for a gift. You just have to receive it and believe it. And that's the hard thing to do because we want to do it our way. We are proud people and we don't want to receive anything for free. But listen, salvation is free because we ourselves cannot earn it. Only Jesus paid the price for your salvation and my salvation. So tonight, receive Him. The last part of Revelation is the eternal state and destination of mankind. Don't be so much concerned about the origin of man, the origin of the species, where did we come from, but be more concerned with where you are going. When you die, can you truly answer the question, yes, I will be with God in heaven. I know for sure if I die, I will be with God in heaven. Because if you cannot answer that question, you need to be born again. You need that relationship with Jesus Christ by accepting Him as Lord and Savior of your life. Revelation chapter 21, verse number 5, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write. He said unto John, Write. For these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Salvation is free. Look at the end of the book of Revelation and look at the last invitation of the Bible. In verse number 17 of chapter 22, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, let him that heareth say, Come, let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. The last prayer of the Bible is verse number 20, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly, Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Christian, is your heart burning and yearning for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? 
If so, invest in eternity. Invest in the souls of men. God bless you as we wait for the soon return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you.